Yeah, I'd like to uh, introduce Julia Shea. Backyard chickens, how to become an extremely terrific backyard hen owner from, by Julia Shea from Who Gives a Cluck. So the, uh, this, the source and the farming practices of where our food comes from is another significant way that we can each reduce our environmental impact and our emissions and cut our emissions. Agriculture in Australia is estimated to make up about 16% of our national carbon footprint. And the humane treatment of animals is increasingly in front of people's minds. So Julie's here to share some practical tips about how to source your eggs locally, provide a home for rescued chickens and give them a happy, healthy life. After 35 years of living the corporate life, Julie has taken a big left turn and followed on her dreams. In 2012, she adopted six battery caged hens and her love affair with these intelligent, personally filled feathered friends began, personality filled feathered friends begin, began. So in uh, 2012, after moving to the Northern Rivers in New South Wales, Julie visited a local egg farmer to take 10 hens home. But then she heard that there were 400 more that will be culled in just four days. So Julie was motivated to find homes for them all, which she did. And that's when she knew this was to be her future. She has now established Who Gives a Cluck? as a registered charity, rescuing and rehoming hens from egg laying industry and growing a community of wonderful families in urban and rural areas that welcome these sweet souls into their family and get the bonus of eggs. So Julie enjoys researching everything hen worthy and sharing hen tips with hen lovers far and wide. Thanks, Julie. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me, Julie from Who Gives a Cluck, and this is little Ruby, who's been with me for nearly three years now. This is a segment or a workshop for the Tweed Home Expo, and I'm really privileged to be able to share some information with you guys. Now, there's three outcomes I'd like you to take away today. First of all, is as a backyard hen owner, how to health check a hen so that you know what's going on before they actually get potentially really unwell. The second one is some best practices for your hen coop and your free range area, like how wide should the perches be and all sorts of little tidbits of information. And the last one is why not just for these hens, but for the environment, you should be adopting rescue hens just before they're culled. They're still laying an egg every second day or so, and they're still a great part of the family. So let's get to the first part of this. This is how to do a health check on a hen. So I field calls every week from experienced backyard hen owners that say their hen is sick and they're wondering, how do I know, what do I do? How do I tell if something's going wrong and how do I fix it? So let's just go through the basic health check. This is what I do do with every hen when I conduct a rescue, when I rescue free range or battery caged hens. And the ones that don't pass the health check come back with me to stay in the hospital. So Ruby is my model today, aren't you, Ruby? So here's what we do. Top to bottom checks, all right? So the first thing is, now you're going to be a good girl, Ruby. If you're looking at their eyes, are their eyes clear? Is there no damage in their eyes? And she, of course, has beautiful eyes. Then you're looking at the nose. Is the nose blocked? Does it need a clean out? Which it could do. That's not something to be deterred about. And look at their comb. Gorgeous little comb, feels the right temperature. It's not pale, not saggy. It doesn't have any other like dry fowl pockets and stuff that going on. Then you look at their beak. Now you can see Ruby's beak is twisted. Yeah, but it still hasn't affected her, not for three years. So trimming, no. <laughs> So that's the face part and also the wattles. See the little bits of wattles here. Now she's got a little bit of a mark on the wattle there, but that's just a scab from getting pecked on. So she's all good. The next thing is we open their mouth with your pointer finger and your thumb. We put it into there just like this. And this is a smell test. So you're smelling. Does it smell like normal? If it's yeasty and a bit smelly, that could indicate something like sour crop so it's the next stage you go to then you're feeling their crop if it's in the morning it'll be relatively empty if it's towards midday in the afternoon you should feel it a bit squidgy and full so typically for a healthy hen fuller by the end of the day empty by the morning if it's full in the evening and full in the morning then you need to be looking a little bit further what's wrong with your hen girl 
Yeah. Now the next thing is I can show her beautiful fluffy bum because it's a beautiful fluffy bum. But you do check around the vent and you look for any diarrhea. That doesn't have to be a bad thing. Hens will get that from time to time. But again, it's a smell test. If a hen has a diarrhea or what we call vent gleat and it does smell yeasty and very sour, then that would indicate that there is a little bit of an infection going on there, so you need to look further. But if it's just a pooey bum that smells like all that wonderful chicken poo you collect for your compost, no problem at all. Now, the tummy is the big one. That's between the legs towards the back. Should feel relatively normal. Now, this is the most important one because most hens that I've had experience with, especially the commercial Isa Browns, Loman Browns, the way that they are going to pass on and leave us is through egg-related colonitis. And that's when their reproductive systems tire out and the egg matter leaches from their reproductive system down into their tummy and it becomes big and swollen. And that's when you'll see a hen walk with a waddle, squat down, they start to show you all the signs of not feeling happy. That is probably, other than predators, about what 80% of these girls will eventually uh, pass away from. So you need to look out for that uh, and then again take the next step. I'm not going to go into how to treat illnesses, just how to know if they're ill. Now, the last thing is their legs. You've got to check for scaly leg mite, which she doesn't have any, and you check neurologically. Now, the reason I've got Ruby is because neurologically she does actually have a damaged leg. That's why she's living with me. So she had Bumblefoot um, a little while ago. So you can see that one's clawing beautifully, but this one doesn't. And she's got uh, muscle wastage on the left side. So Ruby does limp everywhere, but for doing that for two years, she's a very strong, determined hen and happy to live with me, aren't you, darling? So that's what to expect when you're doing a health check on a, on a hen, as well as obviously their feathers, feather growth, make sure there's nothing being pecked. And all hens, you would want to be treating them as a health check, let's say every six months, with a good all-round wormer like Avatrol Plus, tablets down the throat, where you can get a liquid in the water. I prefer the tablets because it's more direct and you know they're getting exactly what they need. And maybe a bit of ivermectin or noramectin on the back of the neck for lice and mites. A little bit of a tip overview. I do have some PDF presentations that'll give you all that detail. Uh, but do keep your eye on your hens. You're looking for signs of them not coming out early in the morning with the rest of them, going in too early in the afternoon, not running to the food. They're hiding away from you. That's all indicators that they're not feeling well because a hen, because they're a predated upon, aren't you? and they want to stay within the flock, will hide their illness for as long as they possibly can. So usually by the time you get to know if you're not really paying close attention is when they've only got a day or two to go and they're really unwell. So keep that all in mind and Who Gives a Cluck's always here to help you with more advice. See you at the next segment. Hello, welcome to this next session. In this session, I'm wanting to talk to you about the best backyard you can give for your hens and the coop and all the little tidbits that go with it. I also want to do a quick mention about adoptions and why you should rescue hens and not buy new pullets, which is great for the environment to do so. Let's start with your backyard. Now, this is the coop of a mother clucker. Our adoptive hen parents are called mother cluckers, cheeky name I know. But just so you know, coops can be grand like this one, which it has its own water tank predator-proof caging, or it can be something small like this that Simon, another one of our mother cluckers, bought for his four girls. Nice and secure, he bought it online. You can see the predator-proof wire, locks them up at night. They go safely up into their little coop and perches, nesting boxes. He can easily access them from the back so he's not having to get in and crawl down anywhere. So you can have any variety of coops. Just remember to make sure there's good ventilation so it's not too hot and that it's easy for you to access eggs or just to clean out the coop and it's predator proof at night. Now let's move on to the roosts. This photo here is showing you some Australorps and a little one at the back. They're on a three by one plank. That's what we're recommending. Not round. Hens, unlike wild birds, don't know how to grip. 
So it's very uncomfortable for them. And not metal, cold in winter, hot in summer. I know that a lot of people suggest metal because of uh, no lice and mites can get in there, but hey, give them natural timber, make sure it's sanded well so there's no splinters or anything that's gonna give them a, a graze on their foot and give them bumblefoot. And also have it treated and use diatomaceous earth so you get all rid of all those nasty lice and mites. But please, three by one, give them enough room to sit flat and feel comfortable. If you don't, they're likely to go and nest at night in the nesting box and sleep in there and you get poo in the nesting box that you're gonna clean out all the time. So go for some decent perches. You'll see the ones below, they're on an angle, nicely stationed apart. If you're gonna go on an angle so they can jump from one to the other, about 20 centimetre gap, so that they're not pooing on each other. If you're having them side by side, about 30 centimetres, so one can sit here and one there and they're not getting in each other's face too much. Oh, you'd also allow about 30 centimetres of perching area per hen, ideally. They all like squashing together, but give them that much room. Now, nesting boxes, here's one good one where they've got a lovely easy walking up to the nesting boxes. Keep nesting boxes up off the ground if you can, please. They like to be up in a nice private space. And you allow one nesting box per five hens, because if you have too many nesting boxes, they're all gonna still crowd into two. So if you've got 10 hens, two or three nesting boxes is ample. Now here's another one I just had to give you. This is a retro TV, he's pulled the screen out, and isn't she a star? That's her nesting box. So be inventive. I've used milk crates, cut the holes out, put them up on the walls, anything will do the trick. Now, wanted to show you areas generally. On the left is the hen caravan we bought that I'm converting for the Pui Bum Brigade, um, which I've called the Chantelles. And they'll be living in this and under a beautiful big mango tree with lots of shade and sun. But just in this particular case, the left is what had been used as a hen coop. You can see that the angle is very steep and the timber is tiny. Those hens wouldn't have been sleeping on there very much at all. You can see some might have a little bit of poo run. Most of them would have been sleeping in the nesting boxes here because you can access them directly from where the roots are. And therefore, they're full of poo and not well maintained. Also, the floor, the rubber matting would gather a lot of the poo that's being dropped. Not a healthy environment and no ventilation. Now, on the right, you can see how we've converted it. We've put predator-proof wire on the bottom all the poo from the roost will drop down below, which we can rake up and put in our compost nice and easy. There's ventilation in the roof, two big lovely ventilation, so we get the air flowing through nicely. And there's also a, uh, a top over the top of the ventilation in case of storm or bad weather, nothing's gonna get in. And the nesting boxes, you'll see we've reversed it around. They now access the nesting boxes from closer to the wall. We've put a little uh, ladder there for them. So they go in and they've got a private space for four nesting boxes there. And that way the hens aren't encouraged to go in and sleep there, just go there if they choose to lay an egg or have a little bit of hen's end time. The last thing I want to mention was the poo shoot. Underneath these two top uh, roots, you can see we've put some rubber matting. So when the hens do poo, it's gonna drop down and then down again onto the wire. So we're trying to make it as easily maintainable as possible. Just some tips. Now, the garden area. This one will move through quickly. Give them beautiful greens. This is M, she's chewing on farmer's friends. Give them places to scratch in the dirt, sunshine and shade. Um, I'm not too sure on having them on the veranda, I'd have a bit of cleaning going on there. But make sure they've got good variety and at least four square metres per hen for your backyard. There's a couple of other beautiful scratchings, compost, and I think that little girl is going fishing. <laughs> now, lastly, about adoptions. Please consider adopting a hen, a rescue hen, free range battery, whatever you like, instead of buying a new pullet. You're saving 2.7 kilos of carbon, and that's a positive footprint, instead of the egg carton and the transport and all the electricity and energy it takes to produce a new hen. You're giving a girl a home who's not even two years old. If you want eggs, she'll give you an egg every second or third day, but they're a wonderful part of the family. If you've got any more questions, please jump onto our Facebook page, Who Gives a Cluck, or on our website, whogivesacluck.org, and you can go to the contact page and send me a message. Happy to help any hen owner about anything I can. Enjoy the rest of the expo.
Bye for now. Great stuff, Julie. Thank you so much for that. And uh, it certainly has told us how to be an extremely terrific backyard hen owner. And again, you know, lots and lots of positives there and uh, lots of good things for sustainability. So uh, Julie, have anyone got any questions for Julie at this stage? Just pop it in the Q&A box there. Um, one of the things I'd like to know, Julie, is what's the most common commercial egg laying hen, hen breed and why is that the most popular? Okay, yeah, good question. The most popular is the Isa Brown or the Loman Brown. But in actual fact, they're not a breed. They, uh, the Isa Brown were invented by the French back in the early 70s and they're a patented product, which is pretty sad in itself. They yeah. did it a bit after World War II because everyone had a big demand for eggs and they thought, oh, we can make this chook lay an egg every day. You know, poor old hens are only laying about um, 60 or 100 eggs a year, two or three a week. But no, they produce this product and they still have a current patent on them. So they're the Isa Brown. So they're a prolific egg layer which in fact decreases their lifespan. You know, most hens should live to eight, 10 years, heritage breeds do. But these poor girls, you know, four to six years at best because they just tucker out. Like if you and I, Jane, had a baby every nine months, we may not live too long. Oh, don't even suggest that, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that certainly was the case a few years ago, wasn't it? The uh, oh, yeah, large families. Yeah. Um, Excellent. And you did tell us why, you know, we should be using backyard hens instead of getting young pullets. Um, because how, how many years do you think you would get out of um, a rescue hen? Well, you get them at anywhere from 18 months to just under two years. Now, like all humans, they're sentient beings. So some may live six years, others may only live two and a half years. Um, but typically an Isa Brown or Loman Brown, you'd probably got them for four to four and a half years. And because you're getting them at just under the two year mark, you've got probably another couple of years there typically of a hen that's still gonna give you an egg every day, maybe every second day, every third day. The hens I'm about to do this weekend down to Grafton, a couple of hundred of them, uh, this um, battery farm uh, are very clear because it's that row and that row are what we call 60 percenters, which means 60% right. of the time. So at least every second day, they all lay an egg, a little bit more, 10% more. Yeah, they're very clear on their stats and decide when to mm. move yep. them on. But perfect for a backyard hen. So, yeah. Yep. yep. Excellent. Great. Uh, and we have had a question come in from Jacinta. Should we be giving the hens scraps from the kitchen? Absolutely, you give them scraps. Not entirely. Uh, you've got to make sure you give them a good, well-sourced protein feed that actually has pellets in it. I do feed my guys um, organic or sustainable country heritage uh, grains, and they've got a pellet in them. It's also vegetarian because I'm not keen on the type of meats that go into some hen products. You know, a little bit doubtful what sort of uh, antibiotics or whatever's in there. So giving them kitchen scraps is terrific. In fact, because they're omnivores, you can give them meat. You can, in fact, give them, if you do eat meat, chicken. Like I know it sounds awful, but the hen doesn't distinguish between that. They love grubs, worms, insects, meat. Um, what you don't feed them from your kitchen scraps is anything mouldy or off, yeah? You just don't do that. You can crush up the eggshells and give them the eggshells back mixed in. It's a good source of calcium. So pretty much everything. Uh, there's a couple of no-nos, but no big deal. You go ahead and give them your kitchen scraps. They'll make beautiful compost for you. Excellent. And Emily has asked how, many, how much area is considered appropriate and humane for chickens to roam? Now, for a backyard hen, I would say please at least allow four square metres per hen. So in the commercial industry, they only have to do one square metre, you know, it's hardly free range. But I'd say you've got a home, a backyard, have at least four square metres per hen. That's a lovely area that they can play around in. But it's not so much the area, it's how varietal the area is. Make, if it's just a flat bit of grass and they've got 20 square metres for five hens, that's not good enough. They need to have an area where they can be shaded and lay down, an area to dust bathe, an area for sunning. Uh, so it's the variety of the area as well as the space. Great. Excellent stuff. 
And probably the last question is, uh, how do I stop my hen from being broody? <laughs> yeah, that happens a lot, actually, but not so much with um, Isa Browns or Loman Browns, interestingly. Like I've got, I keep all the hens that I'm not prepared to adopt, you know, hospital hens. I've got about uh, 71 right now in different areas. But the ones that do get broody and they're still a commercial layer, mostly are Australorps, the big black ones, you know, they're very tough ones. I had just last week all four of them lined up broody. The easiest way is they're broody because if you imagine they're hot in the tummy and they want to lay down and lay an egg. So what I've done is I've got an old cockatoo cage, put it on its side, so the wire's on the bottom, up on a couple of besser bricks, so you get ventilation coming through. And I put the hen in there for three to four days maximum, give them feed and water. I know they're bored for that time. But what it does is it allows the air to circulate around their tummy and they naturally cool down. You bring them out in three days time and they're back to normal. And it's not hurting them. You know, it's just a lovely natural way to say, we've got to cool your belly down, love. 